This video will discuss Coulomb and exchange operators in hartree fock theory. So in our previous few videos we've been discussing the energy in hartree fock theory, but this is quantum mechanics, so in order to be able to get that energy as some eigenvalue of some operator, we need some operator which we can use to act on our orbitals and our wave function in order to get that energy. So. Um, we're going to figure out how we can do that for the case of Coulomb and exchange integrals where we have an operator that we can use to get uh, those components of the energy from two electron operators. All right, so uh, I believe we've seen this equation before in terms of the Fock operator where we have the Fock operator being a function of the coordinates of electron 1 acting on orbital chi a, spin orbital chi a, which is where electron 1 is, it's x, y, z, and spin coordinates. And the Fock, or, the Fock operator acting on some spin orbital gives the orbital energy times the same spin orbital again, as this is a pseudo eigenvalue equation, almost an eigenvalue equation, because this operator does depend on what all of this other spin orbitals are. And we also mentioned that the Fock operator is going to be a sum of two components. It's going to be a sum of a one electron and a two electron, well effectively two electron, but we abstract it away as a one electron operator. So we have our core energy, or our core Hamiltonian operator, which includes for electron one its kinetic energy and its attraction to every other nucleus. And then we add to that the uh, hartree fock potential, which is its interaction with all of the other electrons that it can possibly interact with. So if there are n electrons in our system, how does it interact with all n minus one other electrons is embedded here, and it does so through the average field or the charge density of all those other electrons uh, through this operator here, this mean field operator. Okay, so we're going to split this mean field operator into two components. We're going to split it into a Coulomb operator and to an exchange operator. And notice I have this subscript A here because this is the, uh, this is the, these are each of the operators when we have an electron in orbital A or spin orbital A. Okay, so our Coulomb operator here, that is going to be our Coulomb operator for an electron in spin orbital A. It's going to be a sum over all electrons which are not in spin orbital A of the Coulomb operator for uh, spin orbital B acting on electron 1. So we'll define that uh, down below in a second. And similarly, our uh, exchange potential here, our exchange potential operator, is going to be a sum over all of the other electrons which are not in spin orbital A of the of the exchange operator for spin orbital B uh, acting on electron 1. Okay, so let's get down to what these two operators are. So for our Coulomb potential operator, we have the Coulomb potential of or spin orbital B acting on electron 1 will be the integral over all of the coordinates of electron 2, which is occupying spin orbital B, of its charge density, so chi star B, chi B, the complex conjugate of spin orbital B times itself, giving you the charge density of an electron in spin orbital B, times the 1 over R12 operator. So how much charge density is there at that point in space for electron 2 in spin orbital B, and how far is it away from the current location of coordinates uh, x1 that electron 1 is at. Then we integrate that over how it interacts with that charge density overall space, and we're left with just the coordinates of electron 1, which are left over, giving us the electrostatic potential felt by electron 1 due to the presence of an electron uh, in, in spin orbital b. All right, so that's the simpler one because that has a nice classical analog. We can understand charge density and Coulomb's law as a, as a classical effect. It's just now it's a classical effect with probability instead of a discrete set of point charges. So the more confusing operator now is going to be the exchange operator. And the exchange operator we can't actually write by itself. We have to write the exchange operator in terms of its action on a specific spin orbital. So for example, the, the exchange operator 
for spin orbital b acting on spin orbital a for electron one is going to have the effect of the same thing as the Coulomb operator, except for now we are going to swap uh, electron one and electron two as far as which spin orbitals they are in. So we notice that the complex conjugate is still chi star b for electron two, but for the non-complex conjugate, for the, the regular spin orbital, we have that it now has been exchanged and electron two is in spin orbital a, and electron one is in spin orbital b, as they have been exchanged by this exchange operator. So this is sort of gives us then like the overlap of spin orbital one and spin orbital two, and how that interacts with our particular, uh, and how that interacts with our particular spin orbital that we've got left. Okay, and then if we add all these things together, we can express our Fock operator then as a sum of the one electron operators, kinetic energy plus all the nuclear attraction terms, plus a sum over all of the other occupied spin orbitals being not equal to A from one to N, of the Coulomb operator minus the exchange operator acting on electron one in spin orbital chi A, and that all gives us the that all gives us the orbital energy of of spin orbital a uh, times the same spin orbital left over. And just so we're clear and we want to spell everything out fully, that the sum a not equal to b is going to be a sum from a equals one to b minus one plus a sum from b, a equals b plus one to n. So we're including every term. Uh, of all of the electrons in the different spin orbitals except for the one uh, where A is equal to B.